So now I'm excited to share the story of how this all came to be on the day a hummingbird changed my life. I will never forget this date, July 17, 2000. It is ingrained in my head. It was the first summer that we lived in this house for an entire year. There was not a single flower on my property except for a small grouping of snapdragons that I planted along my front walk. It must have been an omen for things to come because as I was walking down my front walk on the way to the mailbox, I was buzzed in the face by a ruby-throated hummingbird. I was shocked. I was thrilled. I don't remember how I responded. I might have screamed. The whole neighborhood might have heard me. At first, I thought it was a bee. And then when I realized what it was, I literally freaked out. The hummingbird flew right up to my face and it buzzed me. I will never forget the sound it made and how I actually felt the air from its tiny little wings on my face. And after that, everything changed. So I decided to go down the rabbit hole. Um, so here's my proverbial rabbit hole. And I began to research plants to attract hummingbirds. Now keep in mind, this was during pre-Google times. We're back in like two th early 2000s. So Google wasn't uh, a thing back then. And I did not have the internet at my fingertips. So this meant I needed to go to libraries. I needed to read books, uh, visited nature centers. And through all of my searching, I eventually came upon New Jersey Audubon and they had programs that were instructed by Patricia Sutton and her name should be familiar to you. If it is not, um, you should know who she is. Pat Sutton is my mentor and one of my heroes and she nurtured and encouraged me throughout this madness of wanting to create a habitat. Um, so I, I essentially signed up for her program that she offered at New Jersey Audubon that allowed us to learn how to create backyard wildlife habitat. Then I became a part of National Wildlife Federation's um, Habitat Steward Program, and I continued down the rabbit hole. So let me ask you, when's the last time you went down a rabbit hole? Well, let's take a stroll back in time. We're going back to the year 2002. And here are my first humble offerings with a few small flower beds for hummingbirds. And this is how it started. So this is the same lawn that you saw in the cover picture. In 2003 and 2004, I continued to peck away at the lawn areas and I added new pollinator beds. At this time, I made a commitment. I made a commitment that I was going to provide food, water, and a place for wildlife to raise young and provide them shelter. And by certifying with National Wildlife Federation as a backyard wildlife habitat, I made that commitment and I have kept to it. So you might wonder where my husband was during all the transformation. Um, well, he's the guy behind the lens. And as the habitat expanded, so did his interest in wildlife photography. So if you know me, if you're one of my students, and I saw some of you are here, thank you. Um, if you know me, you know my husband, or you at least know his pictures. So I wouldn't have um, half the material I have to teach my courses or to sit here staring at my computer tonight to present this to you without him. Um, in fact, for my birthday in 2004, he built me this 800 gallon pond. And this was an absolute game changer for attracting wildlife. So if you're thinking about it, stop thinking about it and do it. It was the best thing that we ever added to the property. Um, I have so much enjoyment from this pond, I cannot tell you. So I continued to remove the lawn and I expanded my beds until there wasn't much lawn left. In 2008, Pennsylvania Audubon rolled out the Bird Habitat Recognition Program. And I was so excited about it. I was the first one to become certified. And my habitat is recognized as a five-star habitat through this program. Um, and by 2008, this is what the front lawn looked like. So that was still not enough for me. Something so tiny made me change the way I think. I wanted to give back. I wanted to study plants. I focused on native plants and hummingbird floral preferences.
after the economy put a huge dent in my private music program, I decided to go back to school. I enrolled in a few work courses at Temple University with a goal of achieving a landscape plant certificate. I ended up going the distance for the bachelor's degree and upon my graduation in 2016, I was honored to be invited to teach as a sub for one of our professors who went out on medical leave. Following that semester, I was offered additional courses and I've been teaching at Temple Ambler in the landscape architect and horticulture program ever since. Since then, I've continued to further expand and add to my growing habitat. So my lawn is nearly non-existent now. And at this point, we have a little push mower and it takes about 10 minutes to do the little patch of lawn that's left. So well, enough about the gone lawn. Um, I wanna talk about the needs of our hummingbirds next. But before I move on to that, I wanted to point something out to you. We have lots of changes that have occurred through the years, lots of mistakes that I have planted, um, plants that don't work in certain places. So this is really a labor of love. And in the top right, you'll see all the Lobelia cardinalis, or commonly known as cardinal flower. And that started with about a dozen plants. And my yard is essentially a swamp. It's a very wet property, so I can grow a lot of plants that like to have wet feet. We are also in an old neighborhood with lots of shade, so um, Lobelia love to be in the shade. And there was a huge red maple limb that hung over this particular spot and the Lobelia loved it and they expanded and they just kept on reseeding every year and there was more and more and more. And then one year, the limb broke off and all of a sudden it became sunny. So those Lobelia are no longer there. But if you look at the picture on the left, you'll see all the Lobelia. And what they've done is they shifted, so they moved. And I find that around the property. So when plants move themselves, they're telling me, you know what, I don't like where I was, so I'm going to move. And a lot of times I let the plants kind of lead the way, but sometimes I have to stop them in their tracks. So it really depends what it is. But if you're Lobelia cardinalis, you could grow anywhere on my property. All right, so we will move on talk about the biology of ruby-throated hummingbirds. So this section discusses their needs. And um, in this part, it's, it's really um, important for you to know and understand your subject if you want to attract them to your property. So I'm going to talk a little bit about their biology and their needs. So ruby-throated hummingbirds, uh, their scientific name is Archilochos colubri, and their taxonomy is as follows. They are in the order Apodiformes. And apodiforms means without feet. And I'm gonna use this handy dandy drawing tool. And again, if you're one of my students, look at those feet. Um, look how tiny they are. So they're not really able to perch. So they're not passerines, they're not part of the perching birds. Um, so apodiforms without feet. So they are constantly hovering and when they do perch, um, they can't really do much, they can't walk on the ground. So they're either hovering, flying, or perching. Um, they're in the family Trochilidae, subfamily Trochilinae, and their average weight for a female is three and a half grams, and a male is three grams. So males are a little smaller, and in the bird world, that's normal because the females are bearing the eggs, so they need to be a little bit heavier. Um, and just to put it in perspective, about a million years ago, when I went to elementary school, they told us, well, you're going to have to learn how to use the metric system. Well, we're still not using the metric system. So three grams is equivalent to about a tenth of an ounce, FYI. Um, so the wings, they're 75 to 90 millimeters overall length, which equivalates to three to three and a half inches. And then their wings span when their wings are open, 80 to 110 millimeters, which is about three to four and a quarter inches. So that's about the size of it for hummingbirds. So they are small, but they are mighty. And I'll tell you about them. And let's see, let me try to get rid of this drawing here. Oop. Make it go away. I think I have to erase that. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, there we go. Yep, all right. So what do they look like? All right, well, females have iridescent green upper parts and they're mostly white underneath. Um, they, have, they have some buffiness on them. Their tail is mostly black with white rectrices. The females and the females alone build the nest, raise the young with no help from the male. Now juveniles 
look a lot like the females, except that the males, you could see, they might have some red feathering on their gorgets. The gorgets is the red throat that we often see. And males look like that. And that's probably what you think about when you think about a ruby-throated hummingbird. So this is a male adult ruby-throated hummingbird. They have a red gorget. Uh, sometimes it appears black if you look at it. And that really depends on the ref reflectivity of the light. And their role is to mate with the female and reside over their kingdom. So kind of wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And they don't do another thing except fly around and boss everybody around. So they're highly territorial and they have been known to fight to the death. There's only one male hummingbird per territory. So if you've got two males on your property, that means that you've got a plentiful habitat. And this is important because remember I said my property is less than a half an acre. And we most often have two males all summer. And the reason we have two males is because we have plants on all the sides of the house provided for the hummingbirds. So the one male can't see what the other male's doing, so they're not constantly chasing each other off. But we've found out that our carrying capacity here is just two males because we, we just can't um, have any more because they can see each other. Um, hummingbirds will also chase off other birds, other birds that are much bigger than themselves, other birds that are feisty too. Um, and what I've seen, I don't know if you're familiar with tufted titmouse, but they're little birds too, but they're a lot bigger than hummingbirds. And I'll tell you what, they are tough and they can be nasty too. And I have seen hummingbirds chasing them around and around and around, and it's really hysterical to watch. So anyway, I'm gonna talk about some of their adaptations. And a few of these are really important because you wanna think about us versus them. And they're, remember, tiny, tiny little creatures. Um, so the image on the left, this represents difference the difference in color sensitivity between human beings, honeybees, and hummingbirds. And you can see um, light is measured in wavelengths, if you're not familiar with measures of light, and it's measured in units called nanometers. You know, bees and hummingbirds, you could see, if you could see my cursor, they could see into the ultraviolet spectrum. And they've got photoreceptors that peak in different ranges on, on, the, uh, on the light spectrum here. And you could see that bees have three peaks, Hummingbirds have four, but what you're seeing here is humans only have three. So we see in a very different way. Um, our receptors are very different. So bees, you might be familiar with bees, and they see like flower guides, which means if they look at a flower that's yellow, they might see a guide that might appear blue to them in the center of that flower, and that'll help attract them to the flower. And they see better in yellow than they do in red. Whereas hummingbirds see more into the red spectrum, and that's also thought to be the, uh, the way that their sensitivity is in the uh, yellow to red range. And another consideration for seeing red for hummingbirds may be because red is uh, more reflective as the opposite of green on the color spectrum. And as you can see, hummingbirds do not have a peak in the green spectrum. So that's another reason why red is a more popular color with hummingbirds. Now, on to heart rate. A perched hummingbird has a heart rate of about 250 beats per minute. If you're perched with a heart rate of 250 beats per minute, you're flatlined. But when they fly, 1,250, and that is not a typo. So they burn an amazing amount of calories. They burn something like 204 calories a minute. So they're very active, um, and their heart is just going a mile a minute. So speaking of flight, they average about 53 wing beats per second. You can't even count them, that's per second. They could fly about 30 miles an hour. So if you've seen one zip by, whiz by, you can feel them even though they're that tiny. And they've been documented up to 70 miles an hour. Which think about that, that tiny little like torpedo flying by you. They could fly up, they could fly down, they can fly backwards, upside down in a figure eight, and they can hover. And they do this nifty little pendulum thing um, when they're getting ready to breed and also when they're territorial. It's pretty cool. They just kind of go back and forth like a pendulum. So hopefully you'll get to see that. All right. So another adaptation that hummingbirds have is called torpor. And hummingbirds aren't the only animals that use torpor, 
but um, we're going to use it as it applies to hummingbirds here. So they may enter torpor if food availability does not meet their body's specific metabolic rate. So remember, they, they're burning so many calories. So if they can't meet that need, they need to adapt a strategy to, um, you know, to combat that. So torpor for hummingbirds can be risky because it's a state of decreased physiological activity. So they can drop their body temperature and they could drop their heart rate. And when they do this, they look like they're dead. They're hanging upside down. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't come out of torpor, um, but it's a risk that they take. And the reason that they'll go into torpor, and it's especially common during migration on chilly mornings, so we didn't get to the part about what they eat, but they're primarily insectivores, even though we think of them visiting flowers. And when it's cold out, insects are not out. So that means insects aren't available to hummingbirds. And to add to that, nectar becomes more viscous, which means it becomes more thick and syrupy, and it's more difficult for them to obtain and take up. So that's why a hummingbird might go into torpor. All right, so speaking of migration, um, they have a very interesting migratory path. They have a winter range that is currently expanding throughout the Gulf states. And this is thought to be either due to global warming, climate change, or the fact that lots of people are providing uh, food sources for hummingbirds along the Gulf states. Uh, another reason is thought is that some hummingbirds will migrate straight across the Gulf but some migrate, some migrate around the Gulf and they hug the coast. Like it's almost like they're afraid to cross. And if I was that tiny, I would be scared too. Um, so further study is suggested and there are research projects that are, that are underway for this. Um, but that's a couple of the ways that hummingbirds might migrate. And they generally go down to Mexico and into Central America in the winter time. Males. Males arrive first and males depart first. So you should see male hummingbirds first. So if you see a female hummingbird, it means your male has already come through. Um, and they start to migrate north about February from Florida and they slowly move north. They arrived in our area a couple of weeks ago. Um, mine aren't here yet, but I'm expecting them any day now. And because I have years of data, my early date for hummingbird arrival here at my house is April 24th. My late date was May 10th, and I was a total basket case that year. They were so late, I thought they weren't coming back. All right, so more about hummingbird migration. This is a hummingbird map, and you could go to journeynorth.org, and not only can you look at hummingbird migration, but you can look at several other animals as well. You could follow the uh, monarchs coming north too, which is what that site is known for. So here's the map, and the map is current as of this week. And you can see they're in our area. They're just not at my house yet, but any second now. And I keep looking out my window. Um, so I had to use last year's hummingbird, but there'll be one soon. All right, so habitat and conservation. Uh, Ruby-throated hummingbird is a fairly common bird. You know, you're likely to miss it because they're tiny. So one of the ways that you can get to know them is by the sounds that they make. And they make a little chirping sound. And if you go on to Audubon's website, or if you download an app, or if you go to Cornell's All About Birds, you can listen to the sound they make. And once you hear the sound, then you can spot where they are and you can watch them. Because they're really all over the place. They love to nest around neighborhoods and yards in riparian areas along streams where there's some forest cover. They like clearings and gardens and orchards. So you can find them almost anywhere. So conservation for them is not really a major concern. Um, we do have concerns, of course, with anything. Habitat destruction is always a concern. Herbicides and pesticides. Um, we do not want to spray anything that is toxic on our properties. Well, we shouldn't be spraying anything anyway. You just, if you, if you invite all the uh, predatory insects and you have a good habitat going, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, predators are a problem. We can talk about praying mantises. The Chinese praying mantis is a predator of ruby-throated hummingbirds. And you could go ahead and Google that. I didn't want to ruin this for you by putting a picture of that in here. Um, but they're also, they're, predators are also cats. So keep your cats indoors. If you're going to build a hummingbird habitat, do not let your cat out. If you're going to let your cat out, it's responsible to have a bird habitat. 
right? So nesting and lifespan. So this might surprise you. Um, the height of nesting is June through mid-July with the earliest nesting as May 1st and latest is August 28th. And the picture on the right, I was taken at Pennypack Trust on May 10th, 2014, right along the Creek Road Trail. And there's no way I would have spotted her except that I saw her building this nest. And her nest is made from down, from buds, lichen and spider webs. And that's about a half of a shot glass for size perspective. So if you're walking along a trail, unless you see a hummingbird and you look up, you're just gonna see this, this little patch of lichen and you're not gonna notice the nest. And they're generally five to 20 feet above the ground and they're often near water. So again, this is right along the creek. It was right near the management trail and um, it was about 15 feet off the ground. And the female will lay one or two clutches of one to three eggs. And like I said before, the female does all the work. The male's just off flitting around, beating up on everybody else. Um, the males can live to 7.8 years. Females live up to nine years. Um, so males have a shorter lifespan because they get themselves into a lot more trouble than the females do. So behavior. Well, hummingbirds are very, very badly behaved. Uh, they're just not nice. We love our hummingbirds, but they can be pretty obnoxious. They're highly territorial, especially the males. I was lucky um, Harvey Tomlinson was willing to share this interaction that he captured on film between two hummingbirds at his hummingbird feeder. And some of you may know Harvey. He lives in Cape May. He is a big time birder. And he also is, um, is, is very into building habitat for birds, particularly hummingbirds. I'm highly jealous of him because he hosted a vagrant black chinned hummingbird this past winter, which is very exciting. But anyway, he's also a really super nice guy and he shared these pictures of this interaction where one hummingbird was at the feeder, another one showed up and decided it didn't wanna share all that nectar. So he grabbed the other hummingbird by the bill and it yanked it and pulled it away. So they are really feisty and they can be really nasty. Here's another example of what can happen in a short minute. So this was in my yard one day. It was at the beginning of August. You could see that's a male sitting there on the hummingbird feeder. Now, mind you, we've got this entire habitat full of flowers in bloom. There's a huge patch of lobelia. This guy's sitting here hogging up the feeder. Here comes another one. And there comes another one. And that was another male. So those three birds are fighting over this one hummingbird feeder when they've got this entire property full of nectar, plus all the insects that are around. So they just really, um, they, you know, they just wanna take over the world. So they're small, but they're mighty. So they're overcompensating for their smallness. So anyway, sorry for the shakiness of the video, but I was just very excited about this. So in one minute, these three were just battling it out. So what do they eat? We talked about their diet. Their diet consists of protein and carbohydrates. So protein they get from eating little insects. And most of the time they're eating insects, they're eating them on the fly or they're hovering and they're gleaning insects. So if you've ever seen a hummingbird um, and it is hovering and you see the little tongue coming out and you wonder what it's doing, it's probably zapping like little tiny gnats and things like that. And that's, that's how it gets its protein. And remember, that's the, the bigger part of their diet. The other part is carbohydrates, which they get from nectar. Um, they also will, will drink things like um, sap from trees, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But contrary to popular belief, um, they do not sustain on nectar alone. So a lot of people think, oh, they, you know, we have to provide them nectar, we have to provide them nectar, but you need to provide other things too. So if you don't want insects around, you're not gonna have hummingbirds. So they get their, they get their car carbohydrates from several sources, including supplemental feeders that humans put up. Until recently, this is pretty cool. Um, it was thought that hummingbird tongues obtain nectar through capillary action. So kind of like a straw where it would put its tongue into this source of nectar and it would, it would kind of come up like, like a straw. But a recent study that was completed in 2015 um, indicates that hummingbird tongues are elastic micro pumps. This is a very cool research study. Um, I'm going to give you just a second if you want to jot that down, that website. It's well worth reading. But what was discovered is that their tongues 
are actually, they actually work via a pumping action. So they pump and they're going so fast that you can't see it. And their tongues are grooved. So they have these little grooves along the sides of their tongue. And the nectar comes up in the grooves and that's how they obtain the nectar. So that was really exciting. And it's, it's really groundbreaking research. And honestly, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it, but it's pretty fascinating. So check it out. Hopefully you've had enough time to jot that website down. I'm gonna move on and we're gonna talk about ruby throated what? <laughs> That's not a hummingbird. So this also has a ruby throat. Um, its name does not have ruby in it, but just to just to uh, add to the confusion, it's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. You can barely see the yellow up here, but that's how they're named, yellow-bellied sapsucker. And yellow-bellied sapsucker is uh, one of the hummingbird friends that offers benefits. And in return for benefits from the sapsucker, the hummingbird helps the sapsucker out. So you might ask, well, what does that mean? Well, you can see the sapsucker drills sapsucker holes. So if you've ever seen holes like this on your tree, they like magnolias a whole lot. Maybe you never knew what it is. Now you do. Um, sapsucker holes. So they drill and they make wells and they obtain sap. So what's really cool about that is the sap also attracts insects and it also attracts hummingbirds. Now, it just so happens that yellow-bellied sapsuckers and ruby-threaded hummingbirds have a very, very similar migratory time where they almost migrate together around the same time as they start coming up north from the south. So a lot of them are in Florida for the winter. And as they move north, sometimes mornings are chilly and hummingbirds are having trouble finding flowers that are in bloom to get nectar and insects are kind of quiet. So the sap sucker goes about its business, drills its wells, tracks little insects, then hummingbirds can kind of come by for a free meal. They can glean some tiny insects that are attracted to the sap. They can also take a sweet treat and they gain energy so that they can continue on their migratory path north to our backyards. Well, so what does the hummingbird do for the sap sucker? Well, remember, you know, hummingbirds are feisty little buggers, right? So on the way back south, when they start to migrate for the winter, which starts to happen in September and October, um, the sapsucker again is moving south, drilling wells, and sometimes upsetting homeowners because they're damaging their trees, but um, they need to eat too. So on the way back, the hummingbird will chase other birds away that are vying for a free meal from the sapsucker. So in essence, the hummingbird will protect the sapsucker from, from being chased off by other birds after doing all the work for the food. So that's kind of the deal that they have. So that's their trade-off. So friends with benefits, it's always good to have those. All right, so you have to think like a hummingbird to attract a hummingbird. So pretend you're a hummingbird, what do you need? I need food, I need cover, I need nesting opportunities and water and places to perch. Remember all that energy they burn. They need to stop and perch. They can't walk on the ground, so they need to stay put somewhere so that they can knock that heart rate down and stop burning so many calories. Um, so food, they obtain nectar from nectar sources. We give them hummingbird feeders. We put nectar in them. We also supply them with flowers that they prefer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, this is Salvia Amistad. It's one of my favorites. And I'll talk about Salvia a little bit later. We need to provide them with cover and opportunities to nest. So in providing them cover, we need to protect them from predators because even though they're feisty, they can't beat up on every big bird that comes along. You know, blue jays like to pick on other birds and I love blue jays as much as everybody else. They're beautiful, but um, yeah, they can attack hummingbirds too. Um, you also need to provide protection from the elements. They're sitting on their nests and you know, this weather now, is miserable. So they're, you know, they're trying hard to find insects and they need some protection. Some of the plants that are favored for hummingbird nests include oaks, birches, and pines. And those are just a few. They need water. Hummingbirds absolutely love water. If you don't have a water feature, add one. That'll bring you hummingbirds. They love this. This is a mister on the left. We have the mister that recycles over the pond and we'll see not only the hummingbirds fly through it, the butterflies like it, other birds will drink from it. And the other thing is a lot of little insects will flit around that mister and we often see a hummingbird flitting around there gleaning little insects and it's a very cool thing. You can also provide fountains. So the red Kmart fountain on the right and I do not 
promote Kmart. Um, our fountain actually doesn't work anymore. And I've seen a lot of people that have attracted hummingbirds to the fountain. We have never had a hummingbird use the fountain, although we have had a red-winged blackbird um, playing in the fountain, but I've never seen a hummingbird in it. But anyway, it's red and it attracts hummingbirds and it's nice to have water sources. All right. So places to perch. This is where you want to get really creative. And again, you know, you want to get in this bird's head. So these are all tomato cages here. So what you're seeing are different hummingbirds perched on different tomato cages. And you can get tomato cages in all different colors of the rainbow now, and they're really pretty. So you can really put them anywhere throughout your garden. And we use them for supports. We don't, we don't even use them for tomatoes. They're horrible for tomatoes. You just stake your tomatoes. But these tomato cages are excellent to put around plants that get tall, um, tall and floppy plants. And they'll come and they'll sit there. And I've seen hummingbirds sitting on the perch actually nectaring from a flower. Talk about being lazy. But anyway, they do need perches, lots of types of perches. So again, look at those tiny feet. So if you're gonna plant all trees and shrubs that have large branches, you're not gonna pro provide a place for a hummingbird to perch. They need small places to perch where they can wrap their little feet around them. And this is something that a lot of people often miss when they're trying to attract birds. So if you wanna attract hawks, you need big mature trees so that they have big perches to sit on. But if you want to attract small birds like hummingbirds and other, and other um, things like warblers and other passerine, you need smaller branches. So you want to consider that. Something else here, this, this uh, picture right in the middle, that's a clothesline. And I put that clothesline up probably the first year I moved in the house and used it for one year. And you could guess what happened. After the one year, you have a bird habitat, you put clothes on a clothesline. Birds like to perch on a clothesline. So I was washing clothes over and over again. So in, in my mission to save my clothes from going in the dryer and, and, and uh, save on electricity, I was actually having to like double and triple wash my clothes. So I kind of gave up on the clothesline, but it's actually still out there and you have to walk under it to get into my backyard. And the hummingbirds love it and I will not take it down. Um, this is another really cool thing. I don't know if you see this one here, but this hummingbird is doing its very best imitation of the American bitter. You can't see me sitting here, can you? So anyway, they can uh, blend in and camouflage, so you need to really pay attention to look for them. All right, so did I mention places to perch? So here's an obelisk and oh, another perch place. So again, you see the little red feathers in the gorget. So that is a young male and he's very feisty, and he's just kind of showing off his excellent preening skills here. All right, so aside from perches, other things that you can do to support hummingbirds and birds and wildlife um, in general. Do not use herbicides or pesticides on your property. Please do not, don't spray anything. Even organics can be dangerous. And again, if you are providing a balanced habitat, you're going to invite all the predator species that'll take care of the pest species so that you don't need to spray anything. Keep your cats indoors. I can't tell you this enough. Um, some people get upset. They want their cats outside. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go on my cat rant right now, but if you want to talk about cats, see me later. Just keep them inside for their safety and the safety of wildlife. Do not purchase plants that are treated with neonicotinoids. And I've also found through giving this presentation, even to avid gardeners, that they're not familiar with what neonicotinoids are. So I'm going to enlighten you. If you know what they are, that's fine. If you don't, they are a more recently um, popular type of a pesticide that are used. And they've been found to be very damaging to bees. In particular, it's thought that they contribute to um, colony collapse disorder, CCD, in honeybees. But recent studies have shown, and Audubon has actually published this, that neonicotinoids are also impacting birds and their breeding and their weight. So if you're going to plant a habitat, it's kind of a moot point if you're going to purchase plants that are treated. If you ask your supplier if they can tell you if the plants have been sprayed, if they can't, honestly, I would walk out. I always ask, and they do have to tell you. And if they don't know, they'll tell you they don't know. Recycle, recycle pots, reuse, return to the garden center. Compost, compost everything you can, vegetable scraps, leaves, lawn clippings, cardboard, whatever you've got. 
Use organic fertilizers only when needed. Um, rainwater capture features, rain barrels, rain chains, swales. So essentially my yard, like I said, is pretty much a swamp. When I moved in here, I used to get a lot of puddling and we've planted so many things, the puddling is generally not as bad. Create a rain garden. Reduce or replace your lawn. So think about your lawn. What do you do? You go out there and you mow it. And most of you use a mower that you have to put gas in, so you're adding fossil fuel. Then you are pulling that cord, you're making lots of noise, so that's noise pollution. And then you're admitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by mowing your lawn. When you could just replace it with a push mower or plant wildflowers. Um, plant trees, reduce your energy bills. So these are just some things that you can do to practice sustainability. And honestly, don't you think that looks a lot better than a lawn that you have to mow? And, and to add you know, insult to injury, then you get the neighbors who have to have these perfect green lawns and they have these lawn companies that come out and they spray all this crap on their lawns and they kill everything off because everything's sterile. And that's not how it should be. So we need to rethink how we are, you know, how we are living and what we are doing on our properties. Do you want to walk your pets on a lawn that was treated? Do you want your kids rolling around on grass that's been sprayed with things? So give that some thought. All right, we're gonna move on and talk about some of the flowers and feeders and what the needs are in this aspect. So sucrose content, this is important for hummingbirds. The mass sucrose concentration of flowers that are preferred by hummingbirds has been found to be between 11 and 30 percent with an average of 20 to 25 percent preferred. So a few of their favorite nectar native sources, Campsus radicans, which are trumpet vine, and Minorita didyma, which is bee balm, um, they come in at 24 and 27 percent respectively. And the nectar solution that you make up, which is four parts um, water to one part sugar, that is 20%, but remember that is kind of an endless supply. So they've all fallen that average there. But interestingly enough, um, I had a wonderful opportunity to work with Dr. Sasha Eisenman, who is our department head in the horticulture department at Temple. And I worked with him on this research project, quantitative nectar and analysis of salvia species preferred by ruby-throated hummingbirds. And essentially what we did was we ripped apart a whole bunch of salvia after we grew them and we extracted nectar and tested it for the percentage of sucrose that they had. Um, we also presented our research in a poster form at the 2016 Smithsonian Botanical Symposium, which was very exciting. So that's the poster on the right that we made up. Um, but it was found that most salvia species with higher sucrose content um, than our native plants are used by hummingbirds. So some of the most popular salvia amistad, the purple salvia that I showed you, that has a 35% sucrose content. Pineapple sage, salvia elegans, 39%. Autumn sage, which is native um, in the south, that is 41%. Salvia coccinea, Texas or hummingbird sage, another native, 56%. Salvia warnitica, this is Brazilian sage, um, lots of cultivars, and the hummingbirds do recognize this from their wintering grounds. That has 57%. So further research and comparative study is recommended because these numbers seem a little bit different. Um, there's also some evolutionary adaptations that some of the flowers have. And one of the, one of the flowers that I'm fascinated with is salvia because there are something like 1,200 species worldwide, and some of them are bee pollinated, some of them are hummingbird pollinated. But these salvia here, you can see the long tubular flowers, and I've dissected these, um, and these are pollinated by hummingbirds. And the evolutionary adaptation for salvia is pretty interesting. So um, it's got this sterile right here, if you could see. This is a lever. So when a hummingbird bill enters the flower, and you can't, you can't see this lever, that's why I opened up the flower. When the hummingbird bill enters, it trips the lever, and the lever then trips the, um, the stamens, and the anther deposits pollen on the hummingbird's head. So then when the, when the hummingbird exits the salvia, it, it deposits pollen on the stigma, or if it doesn't depo deposit here, it goes to another salvia and deposits a stigma. So that's how that gets uh, pollinated, which to me I found was really fascinating. Anyway, another 
and, and there's the uh, lever. I forgot I put that arrow in there. So another really cool um, adaptation that is not hummingbirds are these bees. And I've caught them stealing and they should be locked up for that. They're stealing food from the hummingbirds. So these are all flowers that are hummingbird pollinated and the bees cannot get inside those flowers to obtain the nectar. So what they're doing, this is called nectar robbery, and this is actually a common foraging practice that bees and other organisms use, other organisms that are nectar feeders. So you can see here, they drill a hole right into the calyx, so they go directly into the nectar, extract the nectar, and they're not providing a pollination service to these flowers when they're doing that. Um, so that's a pretty interesting adaptation that they've developed to be able to get nectar from flowers that they can't reach. Um, you can see they are doing a job pollinating. They're covered with pollen. But I just wanted to point that out to you. Maybe you'll notice that. So what else can I tell you? Color. Color is really important to hummingbirds. Pink is not their favorite color. And you're looking here at Echinacea purpurea, which is not known to be a hummingbird plant. Um, it's actually a plant that's used to attract butterflies, which is why it's planted there. And you can see is another side benefit from uh, planting hummingbird habitat. You've got the, the uh, tiger swallowtail butterfly here, but the corolla length is very important for hummingbirds. And as you can see in this Lobelia cardinalis, it's a perfect fit. So why would it want to use this, uh, this, this coneflower here? Well, they prefer red, orange, blue, and purple over white and pink, but most major nectar plants are shades of red, which complement green, which I already mentioned. But once they find you, they'll use anything. It doesn't matter. Whatever's close by, they'll use it. Remember, they are constantly burning energy, so they constantly need to eat. Scent for hummingbirds is not really an important factor. So a lot of other animals, your bees are, are you know, looking for, for scents to come to flowers and attract them, but hummingbirds do not use scent. All right, so here's the important part. It's not just putting up a feeder, it's not just planting a few flowers. It's the height and the abundance of your display of flowers. That's what brings them in. So again, pretend you're a hummingbird and you're flying over and you're hungry, and all of a sudden you see this big old patch of red, that's gonna attract you. If you only have one or two flowers, you know, the hummingbird might just pass right over you, okay? They also um, feed in a pattern. So you need to have an abundance of flowers. The pattern is called trap lining, and they do this where they visit a certain display of flowers at a certain time every day when there's nectar present. So, <laughs> My husband doesn't like it very much because oftentimes hummingbirds are doing their little routine um, during times when the light's not perfect on the flowers. But again, you know, we did plant the habitat for the hummingbirds and not for us, although we do have the benefit of enjoying them. And as you can see, he gets a lot of great pictures anyway. So abundance and height of your floral displays. So I wanted to talk about hummingbird feeders a little bit. And humans like to provide hummingbird feeders, and that's all well and good. Hummingbirds don't need them. The reason that we put feeders up is because we like them. We want to see the hummingbirds. We want to bring them close. So if you're going to do this, it's fine, but make a commitment. You need to commit to keep those feeders clean. If you're going to put them up, maintain them. If you're not, then take them down. Because if they become cloudy or if they start to go bad, you could kill a hummingbird. So be sure that you do that. Here's a few rules for hummingbird feeders. So you wanna choose a feeder that's easy to clean. And you might've noticed the flying saucer shaped feeders that I've shown in several of my pictures. Those are my preferred feeders. They're made by a company called Aspects. Um, I think Yankee also makes them and they make them for uh, Wild Birds Unlimited as well. And they're all red. They're really easy to clean. You just pop the lid off. So they have multiple ports and perches. And you might've seen hummingbird feeders that have yellow flowers. And remember we talked about bees. Bees are attracted to yellow. So you're going to attract bees if you're using a hummingbird feeder with yellow flowers. Um, Sherry Williamson, she wrote the field guide to hummingbirds. And she participated in a study on that with, um, I think it was Perky Pet Company. And it was determined that the bees were not as attracted when the yellow flowers were removed. Um, and Perky Pet's response to that was that, well, the customers like the yellow flowers and the customers being the people that are buying them, not the hummingbirds. 
Um, anyway, so you can add an ant boat to deter ants because ants can be a problem um, and they emit formic acid that can be dangerous to hummingbirds. The hummingbird feeder that I showed you has a built-in ant boat. And your feeder, it doesn't have to be red, it can be any color, it can be clear, it, it can be, you know, it, it can be green, it can be blue. Tie a red ribbon, it'll attract hummingbirds. The big takeaway here is no, 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 red dye, because it can harm the bird. Um, I've seen rehabbers, some of you know that I am involved with Tri-State Bird Rescue, I volunteer as a wild bird rehab, um, and we have seen hummingbirds come in that have ingested red dye, and it actually dyes their bodies. So we do not want to feed them red dye, they don't need it, it's harmful. Um, so just four to one water. So here's the basics, four parts boiled water to a part sugar. Some people say you don't need to boil the water. No, you don't need to boil the water, but if you boil the water, it prevents the growth of mold. No honey, no other type of sweetener, only granulated sugar. Mix it well, store and cool in the refrigerator up to a week. Keep your feeders in the shade if you can, or at a, or at a shade guard. Hang your feeders out before hummingbirds arrive, so when they get here, they'll have it. And they leave in the fall, they leave by the first week of October. Um, so you wanna take them down unless you're hoping for a rufous hummingbird or another vagrant to show up. And in my case, I try to keep one up all winter as long as they don't freeze. So I still haven't attracted one yet, but maybe someday. You wanna change your nectar frequently, discard any cloudy nectar. If you're going away, take your feeders down, don't leave them out. Um, I like to either hire neighborhood kids to come change my bird feeders or I get my son to do it. Clean your feeders. Make sure that you clean your ports and reservoirs inside and out. They sell little brushes, they're really inexpensive. What you should use is either mild white vinegar solution, baking soda, or 10% bleach solution. Rinse them thoroughly and let them air dry. Never use a dish soap because they can leave residue. And these hummingbirds, they bring other dinner guests. So hummingbird feeders are not just for hummingbirds. So you see on the left, the tufted titmouse, on the right is the Carolina chickadee. And these birds are coming to visit because they want to get a drink of water from the ant boat. And that is built in right here. So just another way that you could attract other birds. And these small birds are often bullied at the uh, bird bath. So this is a nice option for them too. So it's not just for hummingbirds. Remember, if you're going to attract hummingbirds, you're gonna attract a lot of other things. All right, so here is probably what you're most interested in. And PERT can help you out very shortly. Um, PERT is hosting a native plant sale. If you are a member, you can get in on the native plant sale. And if you see some plants here that you think are really cool that you wanna to try to attract hummingbirds, they can likely provide them for you. Um, so this section talks about some of the important native plants and some of the annuals and tropicals. Now with these, I'm not gonna name every single plant they use, but it is gonna give you the basics and the basics cover the entire season of bloom, which is very important for hummingbirds. You need to have something going the entire season. So you can't have one without the other. All right, so we'll start here because they're just starting to come into bloom now. These are Aquilegia canadensis, and I'm gonna provide you with both the scientific and the common names. So common names are probably easier for, for many of you, but scientific names are what we go to because a lot of common names, depending on where you are, um, are the same name, but they represent different plants. So this particular flower um, is blooming right now. It blooms from April to June, it gets two to three feet tall, um, and it likes well-drained soils, part shade to sun, and it does self-seed. So this is one of my mistake plants. I put it in so many different places and I didn't have a lot of luck with it. And then finally I found a spot that it liked and it comes back every year. So sometimes it's hit or miss, but once you find that sweet spot, you've got it. Okay, this is, well, I don't wanna say it's my favorite, but it's one of my favorites. And it's in bud right now. And this is Linicerus emperovirens, which is our coral or trumpet honeysuckle. And this blooms all season. So you're gonna get your first heavy bloom in May. And you can see hummingbirds at these. Um, and then it'll bloom all season. It'll have a weaker bloom. Oop, let me go back to that, sorry. It'll have a weaker bloom throughout the summer and then it'll bloom again in the fall. But there's a lot of benefits to this too. This is, so this is a, this is a vine. 
So you need to provide it support. It can get a little aggressive, but it's absolutely stunning. The leaves are really pretty. It's semi-evergreen. It can form up to 20 foot liana. So what a liana is, is that's like a woody vine. But what's really cool about this is it's also a host plant, a larval host plant. So that means that spring azure, butterflies, and snowberry, snowberry clear wing, um, hummingbird moths, they lay their eggs on this plant and their, and their larvae, the caterpillars, they feed on this plant. And then in the fall, the berries, when they go to bury, the berries are eaten by birds. And I've seen wood thrushes visiting my yard, eating the berries on these. So not only is this plant great for hummingbirds, but it's great for other wildlife too. And again, a lot of native plants do that for you. So this one, Silene regia, um, this is royal catchfly, and I want you to pay special attention to this one. So this is more of a native in the Midwest. Um, it'll grow in our region, although it likes some dappled sun and it likes a dry acidic area, which I don't usually have in my yard, but I do have one spot. But I want you to notice the seeds, and the seeds um, here, this plant's just about ready to go to seed. You can see the petals are falling off. And keep an eye on that seed. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But the reason it's called royal catchfly, and you can look here, there's tiny little insects stuck on the calyx. It's really sticky to touch. So that's why it's called royal catchfly. Here's a hummingbird feeding at it. And again, this one blooms in um, May, June, July, even into August. It gets to be a few feet tall. Um, I'm pretty sure this is on the plant list at PERT. And it's pretty short-lived, but it self-seeds. And as you see, I'm pointing to seeds. This is primarily pollinated by hummingbirds. So it is not self-pollinating. It needs a hummingbird. But check this out. There's a seed that's stuck on the hummingbird's foot. So there's that little stem and there's the seed. I thought that was the neatest thing. So as we move on to Minerata didyma, which is bee balm, which you probably are more familiar with. Um, this is a highly attractive plant for hummingbirds. And all of these are individual flowers. And they're also pollinated by bees and butterflies. Um, and there's that seed again. So Minarda didymo, you can see this little guy hiding back here, or maybe it's a female. Um, you want to plant masses of this. This starts to bloom around June, and it attracts hummingbirds like they're going out of style. It's a favorite. It's got a high nectar content, and it's really easy for a hummingbird just to go from flower to flower to flower to flower. So these are all individual flowers, and that keeps the hummingbird busy for a while, so they need to expend a little less energy when they're visiting these. So they're really a popular choice, um, and it, it has a nice long bloom time too. And some other benefits of it, of course, you'll attract the, um, the hummingbird clearway moths, but goldfinches love the seeds, and I leave the seed heads up all winter. It looks really ugly, um, but that's part of having a habitat. So they have a food supply all winter. So this is really important for you to have in your habitat. Another one that you may or may not love, and this is the Campsus radicans or trumpet vine. This is very aggressive. Some people call it invasive. I wouldn't call it invasive, but you need to let it grow. So if you have a small garden, this might not be for you. But I have a big old wood pile out back and I thought I'm going to let some of this loose back there because I'm fighting with some of the porcelain berries. So I think that between this and Virginia creeper, it might outcompete that. So this is another one you could consider. And this blooms later in the season as well. So when hummingbirds are migrating, there's plenty of this available. And finally, well not finally, but this is my favorite, Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower. A lot of people struggle growing this, so if you can grow it, it likes some shade, although I've got some in full sun. It likes to be in wet areas. It will grow in water. It'll grow in clay soils, which um, a lot of plants won't grow in clay. This blooms from July through September. I even have some of it blooming into the beginning of October. Now, this is really important because this particular flower and hummingbirds and several other flowers as well, but these are thought to have co-evolved together. So that means that the hummingbird is depending on this plant. And when you think about mid, you know, July, what's happening with hummingbirds in July? Well, they're nesting in May and June, so all the young are out in July looking for food. And then to top it off are hummingbirds that, that nested up north they're starting to migrate south already. So by the middle of July through the middle of August, you've got a big old party of hummingbirds and they like to have flowers um, to feed from. So this is one of the best flowers that you can plant in your yard. 
And the other really cool thing about it, and look, it's just a perfect fit for a hummingbird bill. Um, these, these flowers are known as what's called protrandrous, which means that the, uh, the, the male part of the flowers come into maturity before the females do. And you can have male, female, and developing fruits all happening concurrently on the same stalk. And that's pretty neat too. And just some more of it because it's such an awesome plant. And again, we talk about um, bees and you'd see here, there's a bumblebee and bumblebees I've noticed frequently on this flower, but I've never seen any other bees using it. And the spice bush swallowtail butterfly seems to uh, prefer this flower as well. So lots of other benefits for the cardinal flower. And finally one, this is actually um, an annual this is Impatience capensis, it's jewelweed. This is another one that likes to grow in wet areas, it likes shade. And I have been blessed with this in my backyard. I did not plant it, it came on its own. The deer do love this, but one really, really cool thing about this plant, if you've got Japanese stilt grass, this thing will outcompete them. So these are coming up now and the stilt grass is just starting to come up, but these have big paddle shaped leaves. So they are out competing that, uh, that, that stilt grass for the sun and these are native uh -huh. and they've got really cool adaptations as well. They have this spur curvature that is made just for hummingbirds to, um, to pollinate them. Also bumblebees will use these, but there's also a yellow version in Patience Polita, and that is bumblebee pollinated, and that spur curvature is at a different angle on that plant. So again, this is another really important plant during migration. All right, and just a few honorable mention native plants. You've got Mimulus ringens here, which is the Allegheny monkey flower. Hibiscus, this is Bushuetos. There's several native hibiscus. Phlox species, if you plant phlox, it'll also bring you butterflies. And then other species that are not pictured here, Euchara, which are curl bells, Penstemon, which are beard, beard tongue. Physostigia virginiana, obedient plant, which is not very obedient. If you're gonna plant it, put it in containers. And in a few more honorable mention, of course, Asclepius milkweed. Um, hummingbirds love them, but you also have the benefit of attracting monarchs to lay their eggs and adult monarchs with nectar. Agastache funiculum, which is hummingbird mint or anise hyssop, it's not in the picture. Shaloni glabra, the uh, white turtle head or leonia, the pink, that's pictured here. And this is another late bloomer. And don't forget your shrubs and trees. So early blooming trees, or, or, or Cirrus canadensis are blooming now. Cornus florida are, are blooming now. One of the first things hummingbirds use, believe it or not, at my house, they go to the dogwood. And this is actually the flower in the center. So these white, these are not um, part of the flower. Those are bracts. The flowers are tiny little flowers in the middle. Um, but there's other trees. Any of your Aeschylus will bring hummingbirds like mad. So Aeschylus parviflora, this blooms later in the season. This is at Temple Ambler. There's two hummingbirds here. Aeschylus pavia, the red buckeye, which is more native to the south. Um, Aeschylus glabra, the Ohio buckeye. And this picture here, this gorgeous now, this was taken at Perth right along the Creek Road Trail. So all of these Aeschylus species are really popular with hummingbirds. Don't forget your native azaleas, your rhododendron periclaminoides and your, um, and your flame azalea, your catalpa trees, your highbush blueberries, your native viburnums, they'll use all of that. And then just really quickly, a quick stroll through some of the annuals and tropicals so you can add different salvias. And again, some of the salvias are native to parts of the United States. They frequently hybridize in nature and they can bring in lots of money, um, many species worldwide. So some are hummingbird pollinated, some are bee pollinated. So you wanna make sure you get the salvia that have the long tubular flowers. And here's a couple examples. This is Warnitica, real popular. Um, again, the, the Amistad. The Amistad has a very, very long bloom time. It'll start blooming like in a few weeks and it'll go until it can actually take a frost. So when um, a really sweet lady near Westchester was hosting this Rufus Hummingbird in November a couple of years ago, I brought her a Salvia Amistad so that the hummingbird would have some uh, flower nectar. And then you've got, uh, you've got these. So these are pentas. The Egyptian star flower, they'll also bring you um, butterflies. You could see all the salvia. So once my, and this is like in September, late September, October. So once all the native plants start to fade, I've got all these annuals that kind of pop in. 
And of course, don't forget about your bean plants. Hummingbirds love beans. So you can plant runner beans. The hummingbirds will use the flowers and then you can harvest the beans and eat too. Your flowering maple, your flowering nicotine, some of your morning glory plants, although I will caution they can reseed themselves. So you wanna make sure that you remove them at the end of the season. Um, your cannas. Here's one, the porter weed, Stachytarphida. Um, they use this in, um, this, this is actually native in some of it in Florida, some of it in, uh, in the um, south during migration. So they see this plant and they recognize it. Um, Lantana, which can be invasive in the south, so you wanna watch. And then your, your, your Pakistakis and your Gesticia, your shrimp plant plants, your Manietta, candy corn vine, um, stackies, the, the uh, calabricoa, your monbrigia, your kufia, all these plants that are, you could put them in a pot and attract hummingbird, your agastachys, your zinnias, your tropical hibiscus, and even nasturtium, which is awesome because you plant all these nasturtiums as, um, you know, as a repellent plant in your garden, plus you can eat them too, and hummingbirds love them. And then finally, don't forget to eat your vegetables. So if you plant a garden, you're going to attract birds to your garden. So here we've got that hummingbird that's sitting up here on, um, on, on one of the strings that's tying up tomato steaks. And here, this is in um, late September, we've got a common yellow bird coming through. And she's not eating tomatoes, she's looking for insects. And you can see the leaves are kind of chewed up because it's late in the season and tomatoes start to look like that. But here, a Tennessee warbler coming through to eat. So we attract all kinds of birds coming through on migration with our plants and our vegetable gardens. So to wrap things up, the key to success, there's several things that you need to do. One is you have to be dedicated. If you're gonna do it, you're making a commitment. I spend the entire summer out there working on this. So fortunately, I work part-time in the summer so I can spend time out in my yard and cultivate my gardens. You need to provide food, shelter, water, and a place to raise young. If you don't have one of those components, you're not going to be providing a complete habitat. You need to have a continuous source of nectar. Even though the hummingbirds are primarily insectivores, you still need to have a continuous source of nectar from April through October because they need their carbs. And finally, never stop learning. You never know it all. I'll never know it all. So with that, I'd like to thank several people. Um, one, this hummingbird. And even when you have all of that, you have these masses of flowers, these little buggers are gonna sit here and fight over one hummingbird feeder. So with that, I would like to thank my references, the Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, Scott Widensall, Robinson Sargent and Sargent, Ruby-Throated Hummingbird from the Birds of North America Online. Um, the second, Atlas of Breeding Birds in Pennsylvania. If you don't have that publication by Wilson Browning and Bob Mulvihill, who is just a fantastic fella, um, I, I recommend that you have that on your shelf. It's an excellent resource. And then finally, I have to thank this guy, Scott Ahern. That's my husband. And we wouldn't have this presentation without him and his camera. So thank you, Scott. Pat Sutton, Scott Widensall, who has spent many, many hours talking to me about hummingbirds. He is just so generous with his time. Sherry Williamson, Audubon, Pennsylvania for originally promoting this program. Temple University, of course, for the education. Sasha Eisenman for working with me on the salvia research. And I'd like to thank Penny Pack Ecological Restoration Trust and especially Chris Mendel, Kevin Roth and Josh Bruce for having me here tonight. So with that, of course, this saga is to be continued, and I would be happy to take your questions.